Good afternoon. My name is Denise Bodart, and I'm on the marketing team here at RealityWorks. I'm here with nursing instructor and educational technologist Casey Carlson, who RealityWorks brought on board when we first began exploring the needs of health science educators and is now lending her expertise to our product development team. Now, before we get started today, I'd like to address just a few quick housekeeping items. First of all, the webinar is being recorded. All attendees will receive the recording of the webinar, the presentation slides, and a certificate of completion. Now, a dedicated question and answer session will occur at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to ask questions via the chat feature at any time during the presentation. At this time, I will turn it over to Casey. Thank you, Denise. So today we're going to be talking about educating students on patient care with hands-on learning methods. So the times, they are changing. Yes, we may have um, the returning to college non-traditional student, but the majority entering high school and college belong to Generation Z. Whatever you know about millennials, forget it. This generation is different on how they learn and view the world. This generation is very tech savvy. While millennials are seen with two screens, Generation X can go between five screens. Their phones, tablets, computers, gaming devices. They can multitask between them all and tend to have a shorter attention span. They are used to tweets and instant messaging instead of lengthy emails. Research from Microsoft has found that the human attention span is shortening at just eight seconds. They say it's now shorter than the attention span of the average goldfish. In, tw in 2000, it was 12 seconds. So as educators, how do we work with the goldfish? Well, while it introduces some challenges, it also creates significant opportunities. In addition to attention span, Generation Z thinks in 4D, not 3D. They compare items in real life to the reality online. Yes, our education styles are being compared to video games. So students read less and prefer active hands-on learning. Studies have shown that students read less than 20% of the text. And I can attest personally that it is less than 20% of the text. It's one of the issues we have with students these days. They want to be successful, but they will disengage from the learning if they do not see the relevance. So Generation Z views the internet and online resources as knowing more than the teachers. This is how they view their educators. Have you had the student that challenges you in class or sends you an email about something they found online that contradicts the textbook or your lecture? Personally, I have found that happening more and more in my nursing courses. They connect more easily with teachers and professors as facilitators or guides. The most effective teachers will be doing tasks right along with the students and showing them that it is okay to make mistakes. We are no longer the leaders in the classroom. We are the coaches. Much less we need to adapt our teaching to the new generations, we also have to change the way we think of ourselves. I will admit that this is one of the most difficult things to change. So how do we teach Generation Z? We need to modify what we do. We have to get rid of the 50 minute PowerPoints, or if you have to use them, incorporate quizzes, activities, and hands-on demos every few slides. Provide them with more than just the textbook. Videos, online activities, group work, and models work well with this generation. Use a variety to keep their attention and give them an experience. Be flexible in your teaching methods and the way you communicate with the students. So why is as important as what? This innovative concept of the golden circle was presented by Simon Sinek in his TED talk, Start With Why. I believe this rings true for healthcare students. They know the what and love to learn the how but rarely grasp the why until they're out in practice. Consider teaching from the inside out. Answer the why question with evidence-based reasoning before teaching the how. They want to know how to apply concepts to real life, and this will ensure it. Another aspect we need to concentrate on as educators is the soft skills. 
Students will come to you with varying levels of these skills. The skills can be acquired through observation, reading, teaching, training, experience, practice, and from other sources. But are we emphasizing them as much as we do the hard skills such as procedures? A widening gap is being noticed between the expectation of companies during the employment process and the performance of the job applicants in the areas of soft skills. Soft skills not only enhance employability for candidates, but they also contribute to the company's success. Healthcare is a business where the customer satisfaction is important. Since 2012, Medicare and Medicaid services began withholding hospitals Medicare reimbursement based on their quality performance. And 30% of the decision is derived from a measure of customer satisfaction. So what is emotional intelligence then? Well, emotional intelligence was defined in the early 1990s by Salvor and Myers as a type of social intelligence that involves the ability to monitor one's own and other's emotions, to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one's thinkings and actions. Some believe that recent advancements in technology have resulted in an overemphasis on clinical competence and a disproportionate emphasis on service and caring within the health professions. Researchers concluded students with greater degrees of emotional intelligence may be more adept at coping and dealing with academic and non-academic stressful situations and that reducing perceived stress may improve academic performance as well as patient satisfaction. This is the Daniel Gold Goldman model on emotional intelligence. I want you to look and reflect on your own current teaching methods. Does your curriculum emphasize aspects of emotional intelligence? How can we as educators teach and promote emotional intelligence in a hands-on way? So let's discuss some options. Simulation is the imitation of the operation in a real world process or system over time. All simulations need a type of model. The International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning has developed standards of best practice in simulation. In order to provide an evidence-based, hands-on experience, the standards suggest the following steps. As an example, we will use this shaken baby simulator from RealityWorks. This shaken baby simulator is a powerful demonstrator um, and used in child abuse prevention courses, childbirth, prenatal and parenting classes, health occupations, and family consumer sciences classes. The clear head with the LED lights depicts how an infant's brain is affected by a few seconds of shaking. So now, now let's apply those standards. First, we need to perform a needs assessment to provide evidence that this simulation is needed. As we all know, shaken baby syndrome is an issue in society. So the needs assessment for this was already predetermined. Then we need to construct measurable objectives, and these objectives are in the curriculum that goes with the model. We need to structure the format of a simulation based on theory and evidence in practice. Like I said, the LED lights depicts how the infant's brain is affected by the shaking. Then you need to design a scenario or maybe a case study to provide the context for the simulation-based experience. Once again, this is provided in the RealityWorks curriculum. We can use a variety of fidelity to create the required perception of realism. So you note that there's not only the, the clear head, but also a real uh, life-size baby and life-size skin. And then maintain a facilitated approach that is participant-centered and begin the simulation experience with an introduction and end with a reflection. A lot of this is involved in the curriculum. So which is better, low or high? There are two main categories in simulation, low fidelity and high fidelity. Low fidelity are realistic models that mimic areas such as anatomy and physiology. High fidelity are items such as mannequins that can talk, bleed, and have anatomic sounds. Both have their pros and cons. The low fidelity is less expensive to buy and maintain. They also have a realistic look and feel 
and a large number of models could be available for students. It takes a limited amount of training to operate the models, and the models are quite portable. But they're not as fancy and realistic as the high fidelity ones. But high fidelity models are very expensive in upwards of, and well over $100,000. They also have the realistic look and feel. They're more techy for students, but also for faculty. Students are excited about the high fidelity, but they can develop negative feelings if they didn't learn anything. High is sometimes used more as an assessment tool versus a practice tool and can be more intimidating than low fidelity. With high comes a fear factor. Is my patient going to code? In my experience, low fidelity seems to fit better for new concepts and the first year students. High fidelity seems to be less intimidating to upperclassmen. And we can use them to mimic things in a clinical setting, such as emergencies. So research by Goldstone explored the development of critical thinking for students who received instruction using high fidelity patient simulation versus low fidelity patient simulations. They also, there's also research out there on empathy and increasing, uh, empathy increasing as well as both types of fidelity. So both groups showed an increase in critical thinking skills despite high and low fidelity, but there was no statistical significant difference between the two groups. The key is to use the appropriate types of fidelity that create the required perception of realism that will allow participants to engage in a relevant manner. So remember that you are creating an experience. You are competing with those video games. You need to set the stage for the experience by introducing the concept in a simple way based on the previous level of experience. So here's a time that you can work on your soft skills. We need to encourage the students to communicate with each other. It promotes teamwork and confidence in communicating with each other especially in peer-to-peer -peer and group activities. I know students do not like to do group work, but it seems more receptive if it is shorter in time. In my class, we use pair and share, which means you pair up with the person next to you and you either share what you've learned or perhaps answer or discuss some questions. Since sometimes there are no exciting models to touch, we need to provide them and the students a scenario that causes them to critically think and it challenges them. For example, the RealityWorks healthcare products come with focus activities that students complete before the content is presented. Educators have a choice to review anatomy and or complete an empathy activity. So here is an example of a focus empathy activity. The students are told to read the following scenario where they imagine that they have been just diagnosed with diabetes. The healthcare provider tells them that they'll have to give themselves a subcutaneous insulin injection three times a day based on a blood sugar level for the rest of their lives. They cannot skip a dose. We ask them to reflect on the situation. How do you feel about giving yourself injections three times a day? And then how do you think this would impact your social life, your school life, your work life? And then share your thoughts with a peer. This is a great example of that pair and share. There are multiple ways to provide the content then. The key is to keep it short and change it up. This is more challenging though if you're presenting online. Tell a story. Answer the question, where will I use this in real life? Remember the why is more important than the what. Ask questions at crucial moments. What would you do if? Organize your presentation into clear points. For example, in nursing, we use the nursing process. Design the PowerPoint for education and not distraction. Treat your students like adults, not kindergartners. Do not read from your slides because students need practice listening to another person. Use visuals to ground abstract ideas. This is a great time to introduce the models like a great reveal. Make them excited to practice. So demonstrations are the attention grabbers. They're an excellent way to teach students to use new equipment or to teach the steps in a new process. They are also effective in teaching safety skills and common pitfalls. Allow students to practice and have that hands-on experience as you coach them. 
they will make mistakes and it is important to encouraging them to be successful. Combined with the opportunity for questions and answers, this is a powerful, engaging form of training. But don't forget the instructions. Students remember more by doing. However, make sure they're practicing the correct way if they are practicing outside of the class, such as in a lab setting. Here is a sample of instructions on how to give a subcutaneous injection from one of our Reality Works curriculums. Please note that washing hands is a step. If it's not in the instructions, most students will not do it. So what makes a good model? Well, we know it has to look and feel real. You know when you have had a good model, when the students buy into it, they like it. Maybe it's say how cool or maybe gross, disgusting it looks, and then they treat it like real anatomy. Some of the most realistic models I have seen are being used in the military for combat medical training. I looked at those and said, why can't we have that in healthcare? Second, the model needs to do what it says it'll do. If it's real, it will work. And third, it matches your curriculum. You can take the best looking model, but if you cannot use it, or the students need to still pretend with it, it is not the best choice. When I started nursing school years ago, we used an orange as the model to practice injections on. And as students, we thought that was innovative, okay? But then we started to see models that looked like actual skin. And then we thought that was amazing. But nowadays, we have the ability to build a better model that replicates the layers of the skin as well. One of these is featured from Reality Works. The message here is don't settle for the orange. Here at Reality Works, we also have an assortment of wearable models. Some of the models give the wearer real life experience, such as our pregnancy simulators. Students can feel and build empathy regarding pregnancy. Other wearable models give the peer the experience of completing a procedure on a patient, such as wound care or IV insertion. Just think of the difference a student feels completing a procedure on a standalone model versus one connected to a real life person. My students have said they were far more nervous on a real person, which is an experience I would rather them have in a lab setting instead of in a hospital. Reality Works also has models such as this injection trainer that not only shows anatomy on one side, but also gives student feedback. For example, if a student injects into the wrong depth or the wrong location, a buzzer will sound and lights will show which nerve was hit. Now remember, Generation Z thinks of us as facilitators and would rather have a device give them feedback than us. So these models would be a good fit for this generation. And remember that we need to include students in the learning process and give them that experience they will remember. Well, this is the Reality Works Geriatric Simulator that enables users to experience visual impairment, restricted range of motion, loss of sensation in the hands, joint stiffness, decreased sense of balance, confusion, just to name a few. Just imagine how much more a student could learn mentally and emotionally with this immersive experience. This is a great tool to promote that emotional intelligence. So at the end of the experience, make sure that you facilitate reflection on the individual performance. How did it go? How did they feel during this experience? Did you meet the outcomes? How can you make this a good experience then for your patient? Facilitate that appropriate critical thinking, clinical judgment, reasoning, reflection, and reflective thinking. So I know you're thinking, oh, this is a lot of information. I'm overwhelmed. And also revising takes a lot of time. I can empathize with you. I've done many, much revisions in my lifetime. And also to where do I start? Well, here at Reality Works, we can help you. Um, I can honestly say that the team at Reality Works takes in consideration the needs of educators. They do understand budgets and needs. They go to conferences and they listen to educators from around the world. There's a team of professionals that can assist you. Their products come with curriculum that have soft and hard skill focus. And at this time, we welcome your feedback and questions. 
Now we've just got um, a few new things to uh, showcase here at Reality Works that we've been working on for the last several months, and we're very excited to um, showcase uh, several new nursing models, simulators, and task trainers. Um, we will be having some products that teach catheterization. Um, we will be offering things that teach uh, venipuncture, IV training, artery puncture, um, IV administration. We also hope to teach um, injection training using small and large intramuscular injection pads. We have a, a fantastic decubitus ulcer care simulation kit and also our geriatric nursing uh, mannequin where it's a, a full body size mannequin that you can do a number of different basic uh, CNA type procedures on it. So these are just a, a few of the many products that we will be offering this spring. Um, our general timeline is to be able to uh, provide uh, quotes for the products in April with shipping at the end of May. So um, to get more information on these products, um, you can go to our website and as more information becomes available, we'll, we will be putting it on the product pages um, at realityworks.com. So at this time, we are going to take your questions and so I'm gonna go in and see um, if there are any. Um, for anybody out there that does have a question on any of the content for today's webinar, you can go ahead and type those questions into the chat feature and we will go ahead and share those questions and answer that this time. We'll give everybody just a, another minute or two to make sure that um, we don't leave any questions unanswered today. If there are no questions, then we will wrap up today's webinar. At this time, we'd like to thank Casey for all the helpful information she gave us today. And we would invite you to keep an eye out for the new health science product line at realityworks.com. Thank you so much.